Well, a very good morning to you. This is Tuesday, April 12, 2022. I'm Andy Johnson. Thanks for being with us uh, as we start today's proceedings here on the program AM Prime and WESN, the content of Capital. Let's tell you what's coming down the pike in the next couple, well, the next hour and a half or so. We'll be talking with a Mr. Ruben Robertson. He's the country representative for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, based in Trinidad. He made a, a statement recently. It is headlined in, the news, in an article in the Express, don't split the difference on banana production. He's talking about the value uh, health-wise and, and food security-wise of, of bananas in all its uh, variations. And we're talking about getting involved in helping to promote greater production of, of bananas. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll get to that in the, in the second hour of the program. Of course, we take you around the region. Uh, we go to the Bahamas, where there's another story about young people getting involved in some stuff there. Um, we're talking also with Mr. Robin Narayan Singh. He's the president of the Petroleum Dealers Association on the question of, we just heard in the news that um, some people are saying that the more vulnerable will feel the pinch greater with the increase in fuel prices. We have the numbers for you, COVID-19. And we have the, the question and responses to the Newsday poll. We'll tell you what's in the Newsday in Trinidad and Tobago and in Tobago. Well, right now we're talking with Dr. Kirk Megu. He's the, politic he's the public relations officer of the United National Congress. And I know he was up late last night. There was this meeting, the, 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 the Monday night report. Um, but he's also a political scientist and he is comments frequently on matters of national interest. We're talking this morning about what we call the, the President's Medal fiasco and the Minister's plan to change the system. Well, you know, inside of, of, of this um, argument about who really qualified for the President's Medal, the, the, the ratings were changed and then changed back. And then in, in the final analysis, in the face of, of threats to take the state to court by attorneys for the parents of both of these children who've been going on this merry-go-round, the ministry decided to sh have share the prize of the president's gold medal between the two students. The minister in the middle of that, the minister Nian Gatsby Dolly said, for left to her, she will change the arrangement all entirely. She apparently was never uh, satisfied with it and never settled on it and how we come by that merit system. So can the minister decide to do that? And if she decides to do it, how will that happen? And what the pro what was the problem in the first place? Dr. Mego has agreed to help us weigh in on this. Good morning, sir. Good to see you. Good morning uh, uh, to you and your viewers. All right. So let, let, let's start by asking you, what, what is your sort of general view on this on this situation, the way it has broken out? Well, I mean, it, it, it's very unfortunate, especially for the um, two children involved. I think that's who we should focus on the most. Um, uh, and the fact that, that it happened shows so much mismanagement. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and it appears that part of the mismanagement and discipline had, had to do with family relations. Uh, which really does not augur well in terms of people's confidence in the way scores and marking is done and so forth. So, so that, that's an issue uh, by itself. But I'm, I'm glad I, I, I believe the resolution was um, something brought about by the children themselves, uh, that, that uh, two awardees uh, would have been granted the, the gold medal and um, in, in the circumstances, I, I think that was the best solution. Uh, so with that administrative error there and the confusion that resulted there, then uh, Minister um, Gadsby Dolly uh, makes this leap to talk about the abolition of the system. Now, if they mismanage this tiny thing, uh, one dreads at what she has in mind, because the PNM have always been totally backward when it comes to education reform in this country. In fact, they've opposed every reform. They opposed when the UNC said, let every child get a secondary school place. The PNM were opposed that. They opposed uh, giving every SEA student a laptop. Yeah, if you notice, the, the top uh, students got a laptop. The UNC's position, not only the top student should get, every student should get. And of course, that would have prepared us for this pandemic where the numbers were from 40,000 to 60,000, did not even log on. What's going to happen to them? The, the system was totally unprepared. 
Uh, even uh, and so, so th- this is a whole mess of, of things. So from one small incident, now looking at uh, a major reform that that we would certainly uh, want to hear more of and are very skeptical about. All right. So the minister is saying that left to her, she will change it. But how, if she decides to do that, I mean, she, she'll have to walk this through to get to the to the cabinet for the cabinet to agree. On that, and, and given the way in which you know things move here, particularly administrative changes and so on, move with with the snail space. Will we be talking decades, probably? Um, I I am not sure. Uh, sometimes sometimes things happen fast when people want it to happen fast. But but given the people who they've been listening to, like Professor Theodore Lewis. Uh, it is it is absolutely dangerous. He he, he is a, a toxic person who should not be advising on this country's education system at all. Uh, the the whole aspect of abolishing merit and these these are the things they they've been talking about, and all the signals they've been sending appear to be the totally wrong signals. Yeah, the minister also sort of put the blame on, well, as yet an, an, an as yet unnamed ministry official who screwed the process up. What is likely to be that person? We don't know who it is, but the people in the ministry know who it is. Um, what is likely to be the, 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 the fate and the future of that person, you think? Well, we hope there will be some disciplinary action there, um, especially if, as the conjecture has been and, and the rumor has been, if, if there was... Um, some sort of nepotism, some sort of family relationship involved. That that is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and but let us hope that this is not a, another case of of people in positions of authority who have abused it, and nothing happens. Uh, we'd like to see some sort of disciplinary action take place, uh, according to uh, the. Uh, establish rules and procedures, of course. Uh, you, you, said, you said at the beginning that um, it appears as though th- this thing happened because of, of favoritism and because of um, relations that some people have with, with, with some parents. How, how, do you, how do you come by, by that? Um, yeah. oh, well, th- th- this is just the information that has been uh, floating about. Uh, the, uh, the investigation hopefully will uh, determine that as well. Uh, hopefully, that will be um, part of the scope. Uh, but but this this has been some of the, the things talked about, and and uh, and that would you know that 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 would be quite unfortunate if, if it were the case. But it, it would provide motivation to why it happened. Sadly. All right. All right. And, and you say that um, one of the, the people who advises, the, who advise the, the, the Ministry of Education or the government on education matters, Dr. Theodore Lewis. Um, is, is that a fact? I know that he, he was chairman of, of this committee that was put together to write this book on was called the, well, I, I think there's a term before it, there's an adjective describing what kind of history it was uh, on, on Trinidad and Tobago. And I know there was a lot of controversy and confusion with that. But you say outside of that, the, he, he is an advisor to the, to the government on education matters? Um, I, I am not sure in in what official capacities he he may be involved in, uh, and it, it may not be uh, official at this point at all. But but certainly his views are are those uh, are, are certainly taken on board, and 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 one hears uh, ministers and so forth. I, and Minister Gadsby uh, Dolly. Uh, appears to reflect some of his um, some of his arguments that he presents in the newspapers. Like, like, like what, for instance? Um, what was she saying? Uh, like, like e- even the whole thing being against the SEA process yeah. itself. Uh, so Theodore Lewis has talked about um, ab- abolishing the SEA, which we think would be a totally backward uh, step. Now. <clears throat> We do. Uh, the UNC has always said that we want to reduce the stress of the SEA, and that's why we introduced many, many programs. Excuse me, such as the continuous assessment program. Excuse me, <coughs> the continuous assessment program, which was stopped. Um, the uh, ex- expansion of the uh, 
um, course, courses and so forth on on the um, uh, on the assessment and and trying to to move away from the total one and done exam and and that has been uh, done away with. Um, so they so the the PNM have increased uh, e- e- even the exam dates being shifted. So so the PNM have increased the stress of the SCA. Uh, which we were trying to remove, what, what, and then complaining about the stress of the SEA. Well, precisely because the yes, SEA came about after years of debate and, and discussion about what was then the common entrance examination. And from what I remember, a lot of assurances were given that the SEA would, re, would, would remove all, if not that stress, and create a, a, a fairer system and so on. But it doesn't seem as though the SEA is any, anywhere near the substantive improvement on the common entrance that we, we will advise it would be. Yes, and that's because the PNM took it over after we left. Uh, and, and then when we came back in government, uh, we, we made progressive changes once again. Again, when you leave education in the hands of the PNM, the country will suffer, as has been demonstrated by our history. Um, so, so when we did get back into government, we did advance um, reform in the SEA system. Yeah, um, because I, you know, there, there was the, the slogan, um, leave no child behind. But that, that continues to be the case, would you say, even though um, the spaces have been opened up, I mean, phenomenally. But, but there's still this question where the, the, the system of education really have is still too elitist and, and it is not equalized for everybody. What was what, your, what's your take on that? If you had to address it, what would you do to, to help fix the system? In, in terms of the SEA system? Yes. Well, let, let's, let's start out by, by addressing what it was supposed to address. Yeah. And, and it goes back to the island scholarship system. Right. Right, which, is, which was an amazing mechanism that provided mobility for poor students uh, who never ever would have gotten a chance to go to Oxford or, or Cambridge or, or or university abroad, and many of our you know best and brightest from Eric Williams to V. S. Naipaul to to who, uh, anybody else you, you could think about. Uh, Dr. Like Rujanat uh, Kapaldeo and Best. so on. And, yeah, yeah Kapaldeo, Lloyd Best, uh, you know, mm. um, were recipients of, of these scholarships, and it, it provided gr- uh, means of social mobility. V.S. Naipaul wrote once that uh, in Trinidad, education was for the poor. <laughs> in Trinidad, money freed you from education. So, so what, what it has been is, is that this system has always provided routes for people from rural areas, from isolated areas, uh, from disadvantaged areas, through their hard work and effort to have a means of mobility uh, where they could not afford otherwise to go to university. So, so this is, um, so, so that's where the, the system kind of comes from. So, so you take it from there and, and you work back. And at the time, we did not have, until the UNC came into government in 95 for the first time, we did not have enough places in secondary school uh, for all our primary school students. The PNM were content to leave 20% of students if you would remember those days, I used to work at Serval, in fact, and we used to uh, teach um, what ages were it? fifteen to eighteen year olds, I, I believe it was, uh, un- yeah. unemployed, out of school youth. We had this huge problem, and not not only that, you had the shift schools. Right? We had this thing where where half day um, you. Uh, students would go to school and then in the afternoon uh, another set yeah, that, that, and, and this was totally inadequate that was the junior secondary uh, system the junior secondary and senior comprehensive system where you had the you know, morning and afternoon shifts. that's right that's right so so the UNC came in and, and addressed that problem first and that took very quick We that, that government was oh, five years six years uh, and, and th- that was a revolutionary change. Kamala Prasad Bissessa was uh, one of the ministers of education at that time. Uh, that was absolutely revolutionary. The, the PNM opposed it. it. It baffles my mind to this day 
how they could oppose that. But they did. Uh, they, they didn't believe that every child deserved to go to, to a full five-year secondary school. That is insane in the modern day and age, but that is the PNM. Um, and so uh, I, after we uh, were out of government and then we came back in, we continued our reforms. Uh, we, we became recognized as one of the, the world leaders in education in terms of technology, uh, in, in, in terms of providing all sorts of access, free textbooks, free laptops, um, free, uh, you know, the school feeding program, all sorts of, of, of so, socio-psychological curriculum changes, um, depressurizing the, the SEA. So, so, so this is what we were trying to do. Um, and, and it takes, takes a long time. And, and when we get back in, we are going to have to continue this reform. So, but the, the main thing we have to re remember is that the whole process is to help students from marginal, rural, underprivileged, um, inner city families who, who cannot um, financially otherwise um, get a tertiary education and, and get in that stream to get there. Now, if there are students that don't want to get into that stream, an alternative can and should be provided. And, and the UNC did have a very strong tech voc uh, program that it was developing as well for people that did not. Because very, quite rightly, maybe there are people who did not, uh, who, who might not want to be in that stream, who might not want to go to Oxford, who, who might not think it's relevant at all. And I, I th that is um, absolutely... Um, fine and, and legitimate uh, because there are many, many, many other uh, paths that one can take in life that are equally as dignified and respect, uh, you know, deserve respect and dignity as well. So, so these are the things that, that we were doing and, and we will have to continue when we get back because the PNM, again, have pushed us back years and years again. Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying there. Um, the, 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 the sort of the, the ramping up of tech voc awareness and the moves in that direction because um, your, your friend, uh, uh, the, Professor Lewis, that, that, that's where, where he sort of came from, correct? Um, yeah, that, that is his field. Mm -hmm. well, what, yeah. But there are people, I remember you know, debates on this thing that, about two decades ago and there's this lady who, who's, who became prominent in talking about her criticisms of the education system at the time, a lady named Camille Swap. I don't know what has happened with her, but she was one of those who was saying that the system was too elitist and it, it, it was you know, unnecessarily too competitive for children to get in and to perform. And so we, to, to the extent that, that that has been addressed, it's, it doesn't seem to have created enough improvement for us with the education system. Yeah, well, be, because so many of our reforms were reversed, as opposed to being built upon and followed through, um, because we were trying to to uh, get rid of that whole concentration on on that one final test by having continuous assessment throughout the whole period, by having the best you know eight of ten I believe it was uh, you know test test results over the past two three years for example, and having that be be part of it by broadening the amount of fields that one could be assessed in so that it wasn't just the, the traditional ones and, and, that, uh, and that, you know, physical education and arts and, and so forth were also involved in it. So, so we, were, we were putting in, and we had put in all these programs, and this was after consultations uh, with all the stakeholders for years and years. Dr. Tim Gopi Singh has spoken about this many times, um, about what, what he did as minister. Uh, and, and they had um, numerous consultations with thousands of education practitioners to talk about what should we do with the SEA. And this was a program they had come up with, um, and, and they were implementing it. Uh, and as, as far as uh, I'm aware... It was to the satisfaction of our educators, of, of, this, of the system. Uh, but it was, 
it was uh, simply rolled back by the PNN. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the, the fact, I mean, and, and to get into the PNN mindset is it, kind of, is quite frightening sometimes. Because to imagine they campaigned on the idea that giving laptops to your children was a bad thing. The fact that they could make parents repeat that political propaganda line that giving my children um, a laptop was a bad thing for my child. I, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around that at all. I can't. And, and I mean, and we are reaping the whirlwind from that. Uh, it, 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 it is, uh, I look forward, I just have to say, I look forward for the time when we get back in, into, I mean, when you look at, I mean, I'm just thinking about some of the, the, the de-evolution that's, that's been happening with, um, under the PNM, and let's say even the numbers of scholarships uh, given out, instead of expanding it uh, as we had done in, in the UNC, because we understand how, um, tertiary education has given persons uh, a why it might be the case with you it certainly is the case with with me and and other people if we did not have this avenue of tertiary education where what would we have done you know my parents didn't even go to university I, I was the first one you know in my immediate family to do so for example there are many 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 other people me too yes. like that yeah you know, and, and, and then w- and, Mm-hmm. What I was going to say, and, and then there, there was a, a, a splitting of the education system in the sense that there was a Ministry of Education and there was a Ministry of Tissue Education, Fazal Karim ran that in, in a certain kind of way. And you think that that was, um, in fact, a, a proven improvement on the product at the end of the day? Yeah, I, I think so, because I, I think both at the, the education at the primary and secondary level is is universal in a way that tertiary education is not necessarily universal. Although we did have the figures up to, I believe, 70%. We exceeded our targets, um, which, was quite, which was quite an achievement, uh, another amazing achievement of our time in government. Because of um, GATE and so on. Yes, yes. You know, uh, be, be, because of GATE, because of the support we gave um, to, throughout the, the primary and secondary schooling system. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, th- throughout the system, uh, and and w- which allowed um, children uh, not only be- because it wasn't only the the, the teaching part. It, it was it was all sorts of things like um, support for for parents in parenting, support um, psychological support. Um, uh, there, there was a an, an all round a holistic view of education we were taking. Um, and what, what the, the PNM seemed to always have this very restricted view. This um, and and um, it, they they always seem to be uh, not in terms uh, wanting to expand it, but but uh, uh, to to restrict it and 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 almost a, a resentful view towards everything. Whereas whereas we have always had the philosophy of of expanding. Uh, the potential for excellence everywhere. They they seem to have this philosophy of, of resenting um, children achieving excellence. All right, and, we, and that is the absolute wrong attitude to have. All right, we got to go. But you believe that this, this situation will, will, will force us to, and uh, force the authorities and the decision makers to go back and, and, and sit down and, and work out how we move forward with education, particularly at that well, level. I, I, as I said, and any type of, uh, the, the, the PNM, they are not known for education reform, and whatever reform they bring in have always been, has always been negative and backward, and they've always opposed progressive reform. Uh, I I do not look forward to to, to what uh, PNM might be proposing, uh, and and we certainly do not look forward to that. We really the the UNC needs to continue its its decades long program of actually improving the lives of our children in the primary, secondary, and tertiary school system. And we look forward to doing that in the very near future. All right, Dr. Kirk Mayhew, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we give you the numbers, COVID-19 in our midst on this day. 
and I will take you through the Newsday question and the, well, the answers when we continue. Stay with us. We dare you to dream, to see beyond the struggle, to envision the possibilities, to live life with unlimited vision. Ferrera Optical supports you with complete eyewear starting at only $795. Let's make those dreams a reality. So book your visit via 227-7000, WhatsApp message 278-2878, or at ferreraoptical.com today. We dare you to keep going. Ferrera Optical says, don't, Don't limit, limit your vision. vision, vision, vision. Change your fate. Start to win at life with $20,000 every month. Win $20,000 every month for 20 years with NLCB's newest game, Win for Life. Six numbers from 28 plus the cash ball could make you win for life. You deserve a win. Play Win for Life today. Visit NLCBGames.com for details. Players must be 18 years and over. Please play responsibly. We have been apart for a long time. Now let's get together once again. Let's welcome you back. Family. 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 North Coast Jazz 2022, May 27th to 29th. Born here, played here. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to the cabinet yeah. with, a, with, a, with an empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we have it. This is a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us, us for, for the, the discussion. discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Welcome back to the program. Well, here's where we take a look at what the numbers are saying to us this morning. New positive cases, the total recovered patients, the total active cases, the number of persons in hospital as we continue to mark the march of COVID-19 in 2022. So those, that's what it's looking like. 130,528, that's the totally recovered patients. 6,146, the total active positive cases. The death toll to this point, 3,783. 140,457, that's the total positive cases recorded in the country since we began checking on March 12, 2020, up to yesterday. And 125, the new positive cases reported in the 24 hours at the end of the day yesterday. 149, that's the number of persons in hospitals in the parallel healthcare system. Well, some people will look at it and say, we continue to appear to be doing good, as good as is possible. But there are some areas where we continue to have to be careful and we continue to want to see the numbers reduced, particularly with cases being counted and cases in hospitals. That number has uh, been inching down for, well, months now. Let's take a look at what's the Newsday poll this morning. What is your view on the increase in the price of fuel? And is it justified at this time? One person says it is justifiable, but our salary needs to increase as well. A second response is that um, the issue isn't that the gas prices increase, it's that 
corrupt politicians have stolen the country's oil and gas wealth and have left the citizens to foot the bill. Well, that's one view. Another view is that at a time when the country is attempting to get back on its feet after two years of pandemic restrictions, the government should have attempted to keep fuel costs low because this is going to cause everything in society to cost more, like building materials, food and traveling costs. This was a terrible time to remove more of the fuel subsidy. And the final response, gas prices, obscene opulence of ministers, price of chicken, eggs, oil, horrible roads, party financiers who now have total monopolies on foreign exchange and provision of goods and services, and leaders who speak to us as if we are all idiots, just to name a few. <laughs> Those are the responses to the question, what is your view on the increase in the price of fuel and it's justif is it justified at this time? Well, that's the issue we're going to be talking now about with our next guest, Mr. Robin Narayan Singh. He's the, Narayan Singh. He's the president of the Petroleum Dealers Association in Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, sir. Hi, good morning, Andy. Good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for agreeing to come on. Let's, let's start from where you want to start with, with what has happened. What's your position? What's your association's position? Well, the association position is that um, we, are not, we are not into politics. We are petroleum dealers and we are price takers. The government are the ones who set the price, the wholesale price and the retail price for fuel. The petroleum dealers deliver the product to the population at large. We, are, we supply the fuel at the gas stations. As a result of that, we, but we do not have, um, there, there has never been dialogue with the ministry with respect to how the fuel is delivered. Remember, we are a regulated market. We are, we are strictly a regulated market, just like WASA or Tia Tech. There are certain things that, that you know, our um, fuel is not... I would say is not a, a product that, that could go into the market because the market is a very, um, it's a powerful tool, but you cannot use fuel in the market just like ordinary goods and services. You see, so it, it is a very, it is a very um, specific um, market issue that we have to use for the common good of all of us, for all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And this is, this is, this is the dilemma the petroleum dealers find themselves in. You say it's a, it's a, it's a dilemma? Yes. You see, the cost, the cost of fuel is set by the government. But the government does not consult with the petroleum dealers. It seems as though the, the, the dialogue, we are just sitting in like it's a political show and, you know, whatever the, the political directorate decides what they do, we as uh, consumers, just like the consumers, have to follow suit, you know, because we have to, the, the difference is that the petroleum dealers invest their money to buy the fuel so that it can be distributed to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. But our regulators are very weak in this area. Very, very weak. Why, why do you say that? What's the evidence of that? Well, Andy, okay. The predominant supplier of petrol is National Petroleum. Yes. They have the largest, they have the largest uh, delivery service in Trinidad and Tobago. The problem is there are a lot of service stations that do not get a, a proper supply of fuel. And there are no consequences to that. Nobody is held accountable. Things happen in, in, in a system that National Petroleum arrogates a power unto themselves and the ministry just, they use um, the Minister of Agriculture, words. the ministry just rock back and let <laughs> National Petroleum do what they have to do, you know? And, and it's so unfair to the petroleum dealers because they invest their money. Some of them mortgage their house, they have overdrafts, they have different things so that they can supply the fuel to, to the community that they, that they um, operate in. 
and sometimes they cannot provide these services. You just drive around Trinidad and Tobago, National Petroleum, get millions, hundreds of millions of dollars every year from the government, and you drive around Trinidad and Tobago, and you will see the degradation, you will see, you will see the, the way that gas stations are in our countryside. They have a few bright spots, but there's no development, no development for the last 50 years, you can say, in our industry. It is as though our industry have become stagnated. Uh, and what, what makes the difference? I, I'm, I'm fully aware of what you're saying there. In some parts of, of, of the country, the, the gas stations are exactly as they were, the fuel stations are exactly as they were 50 years ago, while in other places you have the, the you know, sort of mini shopping, I was going to say shopping malls, but you have shopping centers in, in, in some fuel stations and you could get almost everything you want or anything you want. What, what makes that difference? You're saying it's because of the delivery of the product from NP and, and you're saying it's, the, it's favoritism or some kind of a, of a system that um, the company works out as to who gets favored and who doesn't? You know, I think, I, it, well, I'm not sure. I cannot, I cannot say that is the, the, the main issue. What I can say is that the, the lack of vision, the, the no partnership, there are a lot of dealers who are willing to invest in the development of their stations, you know, but the National Petroleum stand that investment because they want control, they want total control so that the dealers' are, are hands are tied in the development of their, their business. Now, you have to be careful because remember, the, the, the regulations about gas stations, it has to do with, with public safety and, and, and stuff like that, yes. health and safety issues and environmental issues. So it has to be regulated in a way that brings safety and normalcy and, and good business practice to the population of Trinidad. It has to, it has to de devoid itself from from discriminations and, and, and things like that, you know. That is why it has to be regulated. But if you do not talk to the Petroleum Dealers Association, you have not had a meeting with them for the last two years, three years, you do not talk to them. How could you advance an industry like that? How? When market forces does not apply. Yeah. And, and the, the, the agency for doing that is, is more so the NP as opposed to, say, the Ministry of, of Energy? Oh, the Ministry of Energy has, there's an, act, there's an act of parliament that the Ministry of Energy is in total control. The problem is that they're not, they, they, they just abdicate the responsibility. It is as though they, they hand it over to the National Petroleum or they have become obsequious to National Petroleum, you know. It, it, it is very confusing. Uh, okay, take right. for instance, Andy. Go ahead. The uh, Minister of Energy passed away, Franklin Khan. They have a new Minister of Energy. You know, nothing has changed. The Minister of Energy have never spoken to the petroleum dealers. It is as though, you know, everything... It's just, you know, there's an increase in price. Don't you think it is reasonable for the people who have to pay for these products to be consulted in some way, say, well, look, gas is going to go up this way. How, what provisions are you going to be making so that we can have uh, adequate supply for the people of Trinidad and Tobago? Don't you think that's normal discussions to have with people? So, go ahead. But yet, yet you want to have supply of fuel and say only oh, country right through from Cedrus to Toku to, to Tamina all over must have fuel. But you have no discussions with these people how they're going to how they're going to get these funds, how where they're going to get the money, what are the what are the difference in profit margin? Don't you think when they increase the price of fuel, people have to come up with more money to buy this fuel? Yeah. And what are the provisions they they are, they are making for that? Yeah. I, I, this, I want to come back to, to that issue. I want to stay with that issue um, in the main. But uh, again, a couple of months ago, there was this 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 other side issue about the 
the sale and the availability of LPG in, in some cases, in some parts of the country, uh, dealers were putting on something extra and, and the claim about that was that the inconvenience and, and the location of some of these places far from the centers of activity and it, there was additional cost to get the product there and, and so on. Okay. You know, Andy, we, we, we in Trinidad are very lucky in the sense that we have natural resources, petroleum, oil. In 1974, Dr. Eric Williams decided to share this, this um, bounty with, with all the people of Trinidad and decided to subsidize fuel. That's in 1974. But it has come to a, a $3 billion cost to the government for the last 10, 15 years. I mean, we have, we have developed in such a way as a Trinidadians that we have to, to, to sit down and discuss how, what are our goals? What are the objectives? What is our objectives for Trinidad and Tobago? How does this market impact the development of our country? I mean, if we sit down and have a serious discussion, whether we disagree or, or the clash of ideas, it is the Socratic way of democracy. It is the way that people develop as a people. But if you want to rule by an authoritarian manner and do not have these discussions, obviously you will get people disenchanted. You read in the papers where some groups are say that it is disrespectful the way they do it. Obviously people feel hurt when it's done like that. You, they, they do not feel belong. They're not part of a, a system that, that impact their lives. I don't know if this if this is resonating with you. If you understand, if you understand what I'm saying, but, but, but certainly, this, this is what it is. Certainly, and I, I, I felt moved to ask you whether some of your members, even you, would would join the the, the proposed marches against the increase in in prices when that shall have been taking place. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I'll tell you what I I am. I'm over 70 years old. It's not, it's not easy for me to be physically out there. It's difficult, yeah. you know? Yes. But, but this is for the young people to, to, this is their view now, you know? This is, their, this is their country now. I mean, we have had our time. But you want to leave a legacy where they have a, they have a future, they have a vision. But you, you know, it's, yeah, not, you, it's, not a, it's not about popularity for me or anything like that anymore. It is about having something so that, you know, you can feel proud that we are living in a country that, that, that do something for these people. You know, you cannot isolate the people from the, from, the, from the leaders. The leaders are part of our country too. And they must share their vision and interact with the people. Yeah, but you, you're in solidarity with the proposed set of actions against the increase in prices. No, well, listen, I think a discussion has to take place. We and Trinidad are price takers. We see what is happening all over the world. We know what is happening. No, I do not have the full information of how much money we have or what it is or what, what, are, what are the subsidies that, that the, the government could absorb or pay out. I don't have that information. But obviously... You have to have dialogue to know, well, look, we are doing it this way. We are subsidizing. We, are, we have to come off of the subsidy so that we can use the money in a productive capacity. I am not a politician. I don't have the, the, um, the, the knowledge or the information that they have. But what I can tell you is that we see in the, 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 what is happening in the world, and we know we are importers of um, fuel, so we know we have to pay a higher price. We know this, but at what level? I don't know. And you're saying fundamentally, the the the, the space for dialogue, the 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 need for dialogue between yourselves and people in the government is not being met. And and the association. No, not at all. I mean, we have not had a meet even with National Petroleum. Their legal advisors say 
you don't have to talk to the petroleum dealer. So where in earth do you know a supplier do not talk to the to to, to the um, recognized body of uh, uh, retailers? It is it is so hilarious. It is just a power struggle for no reason at all. You know, it's a bunch of egos that 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 there's no reason for it because the whole country is mesmerized by this. Yeah, and our system is such that, and our culture is such that when uh, stakeholders among themselves can't get together or when one side is calling for dialogue and meetings with the other side and it's happening and it's not happening, the, the next step is to appeal to the Prime Minister. Have you all been doing that? or? You know, uh, we have not we have not appealed to the prime minister. I mean, you know, I it guess is a waste of time. <laughs> it is just apathy. You know, you just go with the flow. Uh, well, what do you do? I mean, if you if you're really interested in in in, in developing a country, and you come out to meet the, the people who are directly involved in the industry, obviously you will have. A plethora of ideas. You have a multiplicity of ideas. So what you do is you frame those ideas into something concrete that will could go forward. So each community could develop in its own unique way. But this has not happened. There's there's certain peculiarities and susceptibilities in every single community in our country. But this have not been allowed to flourish. It just, it just seems, you know, as though, well, the winner takes all, you know, every, the, 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 the people who have the loudest voice, so, you know, you don't give people a proper voice. <laughs> and that is what happened, you know, the weak suffer. And, but we all have voices in Trinidad and, and we should listen. We should listen and, and make people, bring people into the fold and let them feel they belong to our country. All right, we, we have to go, but let me ask you, what, what is the one thing you want to see coming out of, of this, where we are at this juncture? I, would, I mean, I, I support meaningful dialogue, just like what we are having now. And... Um, you know, just lay it out, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's, I have, I have great hope for the future. I know that Trinidad will survive. People have a way, even the vagrants survive in Trinidad. <laughs> so I know we all going to survive. Some people want to survive at a higher level. Some people, you know, it, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you have to take to consideration everybody's view. Everybody have a voice, and you listen, and and you help you help them come to an objective or to a, or to focus on what it is you really want to to accomplish. All right, we're gonna leave it there, Mr. Narayan Singh, Mr. Robin Narayan Singh, President of the Petroleum Dealers Association of Trinidad. Andy, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, and you have a very nice day. You're very welcome, and same to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, well, let's just swing into where, where we begin our look around the region. We're going to the Bahamas, where they're saying that thus far this year there have been 44 murders, and that's an indication of crime in that Commonwealth of Islands up the chain. Uh, this, this story from our news source, Bahamas. That's the name of, of the organization, our news source, Bahamas. Let's take a look. Amid a drastic increase in murders and other criminal activities, Prime Minister Philip Davis announcing a number of measures being implemented to combat criminal activity. Topping that list, putting more boots on the ground. We will increase police presence in hotspots with saturation patrols for as long as they are necessary. Our communities need more manpower and more resources. The Royal Bahamas Police Force is creating a specialized task force focused on decreasing gang-related crimes and apprehending those involved in firearms trafficking. As Police Commissioner Paul Roll revealed that the RBPF is short some 900 officers, the Prime Minister says recruitment exercises are ongoing. He also says the RBPF will expand and improve the use of technology like CCTV and drones. Davis outlined the plan to strengthen urban renewal and community policing in reaching at-risk youth. His comments come as the country recorded 44 murders for the year.
In the next few days, I intend to constitute the National Security Council, which will support increased sharing of intelligence across agencies, allowing us to confront our security challenges jointly and with the best information possible. And because criminal activities are not contained by borders, we intend to strengthen our collaboration with international partners as well. Meanwhile, police are probing not one, but two daring early morning break-ins at a local bank. The crime was caught on camera, and the video showing two suspects entering Commonwealth Bank's Prince Charles branch has gone viral. Deputy Police Commissioner Clayton Fernander says police are determined to identify the suspects. Jasmine Brown reports. The Deputy Commissioner of Police releasing a few details about that break-in. As he says, while the video did go viral this morning, the incident was not a recent one. It's a break-in report and that matter would have happened uh, a few weeks back. It was a break-in at that uh, time. While the incident was never reported in the Royal Bahamas Police Force's daily crime report, our news understands the first break-in at the branch occurred in December, while the latest break-in occurred just last month. Both incidents were caught on the bank's security cameras and the footage has since gone viral. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. In this season, we talk more about health, wellness, and everything in between. I am so excited to share with you everything about health and wellness so that you can design the life that you've always dreamed of. Join me here on What's Up Doc. What's Up Doc, Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on WESN, Content Capital. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother, we at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The, the communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I'm tables are turned, when the tables are turned, oh. it's the same. It's the same way. Okay, this has been ten questions. I'm Andy Johnson, and we'll see you next time. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we have it. It's a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us for, for the, the discussion, discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. Every day, we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations.
storytelling is an art. An art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional, and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. A reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other. Yes, welcome back to the program. And let me just read to you a couple of the, the, the opening paragraphs in this piece that was carried in the Express on Thursday, April 7th. The humble banana has experienced a resurgence in popularity in recent times. There are hundreds of videos featuring recipes touting its health benefits, its use in cosmetics, and even how to peel it properly. Indeed, the banana is rich in vitamins and other nutrients. It contains a moderate amount of fiber and antioxidants, one banana provides about 112 calories and consists almost exclusively of water and carbohydrates with little protein and no fat. Banana can improve blood sugar levels through its fiber content while its pectin levels are being researched as possible protection against colon cancer. Its potassium content has been shown to assist with both blood sugar and blood pressure management as well as kidney function. Studies have shown that people who eat plenty potassium have up to a 27% lower risk of heart disease. This is in addition to high concentration of antioxidants including flavonoids and animes. That piece goes on to talk to rhapsodize about banana in its, its many manifestations. I'll get to some of that. What I didn't know reading this piece about things that are in fact part of the, the uh, banana family. It was written by Mr. Ruben Robertson. He's the country representative for the Food and Agriculture Organization of Trinidad and Tobago, and he's promoting uh, a resurgence in banana cultivation and consumption in Trinidad and Tobago, as is the case in other parts of the region and the world. Mr. Robinson, thanks very much for coming on to talk about this. Good morning, sir, and thanks very much for having me on your program. All right, well, well let me start by asking you what, what led you to write this piece? <laughs> <laughs> well, currently I'm in Tobago. Yes. And FAO is working assiduously with the Tobago House of Assembly Department of Agriculture to establish a banana plot intercrop with sweet potatoes to demonstrate that with good irrigation systems, banana production can be a, a livelihood for farmers um, in Tobago and by extension in Trinidad and Tobago. So, so you, you're on the ground there right now because something is happening relating to that. Yes, and um, hopefully in another couple of weeks, we will be able to demonstrate to the, the general public, all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, 
how this can be done with some levels of science and technology. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about, um, so the, how is the, the FAO um, working directly to uh, achieve some of these aims, to arrive at, at, at these ambitions? Well, Tobago, I would say Trinidad and Tobago is a country that has a very high food import bill. And uh, there is a government policy which seeks to address food and nutrition security to ensure that all um, citizens within the population has easy access to readily available food. And in doing so, the farmers are encouraged to focus on those commodities that they have a comparative advantage. And so that has started. But if you look at bananas, bananas has... As, as a commodity has been a significant import, I, imported item into Trinidad and Tobago, and by extension, Tobago. Tobago pays a, a higher price because the commodities, including bananas, have to be transshipped from Trinidad to Tobago. So the prices that are, though, though reasonably high, I would say in Trinidad, are even more higher in Tobago because of the transshipment there. And so we looked at the agroecological conditions of Tobago, and um, some of them mimic the banana producing areas in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where I am from. And in discussions with the technocrats here in Tobago, we decided that perhaps we should start with a pilot. And this pilot is in the Roxborough area. Um, so we are doing some work there now. I do not want to, to expose too much of what we are doing. You don't want to go ahead but, of yourself, um, as they say. Hopefully, in another few weeks, we will be able to demonstrate the success of this pilot um, to be able to show farmers and other investors what the possibilities are. Most of the times, we look at, um, at bananas as just a commodity to make money. But what we are trying to do is to integrate it into the food system, where as the products are produced, that is the bananas and the sweet potatoes, we are looking at how we can integrate them into the school feeding program. And not only that, to the hospitality industry. So from the bananas, how do we go towards this end product? to have it in the school system. We have to have it ready. And therefore, having a small ripening room that will bring, make the bananas readily available in this form as is imported is critical. So the entire value chain is being addressed in this regard. Yeah. Can, can you explain, you, you, you used the term a while ago, explain what, what it means in terms of what you're doing, the agroecological conditions. Okay. So... We, you know that climate change is having a significant um, impact on agricultural production. Yes. So in some areas where farmers would normally plant their crops, now they have serious problems with drought and in some cases flood. But um, while these excessive um, high temperatures and, and long sunlight or the length have been affecting some of the agriculture production. In some areas, due to the, the, the microclimate there, for example, you might have a forested area around that allows for the, um, the, the coolness of the area. Um, you know, the use of a forest in terms of trapping um, the, the rainfall and the the moisture content there tend to be much higher than in the open areas. So like in um, Roxborough um, and in the Kendall area, there are some forested areas there which have microclimates lower down the, the slope um, that you, you have um, what I would say cool temperatures for longer periods of the year. And these cool temperatures allow the soil to, to stay moist for a longer period than most of the other open areas. 
And this is the kind of environment that bananas like. They thrive much better in cool conditions. And so with a combination of irrigation, they can perform exceptionally well once there is efficient management to control the pests and diseases that plague banana production in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, and you know, coming back to the narrative here, I mean, it's it's, it's you know, it's so rich in, in in possibilities and well, the occasion for optimism because, so we 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 grew up knowing that it was good to to eat green fig or ripe fig, as, as you point out here, that that's the, the local names for them. But the the number and the, the wide expanse of of health benefits that you put out here, that is that going to be news to a lot of people. That, Contingent upon and, and continuing upon what I what I read in the top, you say both ripe bananas and unripe bananas, so yellow bananas and, and green bananas, can satisfy your sweet tooth and keep you healthy. They are perfect for athletes and benefit the human body before, during, and after training or exercise. It is indeed the, the perfect fruit. Yes, yes, it is. And um, most times we have our our citizens going for the imported fruits like um, like apples and grapes and so on and bananas. Bananas can satisfy all of those um, those well provide all of those ingredients that these apples and grapes provide. So we do not need really to be importing these these types of fruits. Um, when we readily have available bananas. And if we can increase the domestic production to satisfy such demand, then um, it is even better for our small farmers who can actually eke an income out of this and at the same time satisfy the food and nutrition security demands of the country. Yeah, and then you, you, you go on to, to talk, again, this is, this is news and education for people like myself and others. You talk about, so green fig, we know what that is. Well, chiquito fig, we know what that is. Uh, or sikia fig, as you see, and grammy shell, and, and, and moko and plantain. So, so moko and plantain are sort of cousins to, to, to green fig? And, and well, they, are, they belong to the same yeah. family, the musa species. But um, our Caribbean um, culture, we tend to, to use them differently. So we more use the banana type, like the Gros Michel, the yeah. Sukye Fig, the Williams, the Valerie, the Dwarf Cavendish, the Granine. All of those we consider to be the banana type that we, we eat as a fruit. Some persons would eat like the what we refer to as the green day. Um, I don't know if it's moko you call it here. Yes. Um, the, the mafa bay. Yes. Also, some people call it um, the moko. Um, but those are used as what we call green, green fig. Yes. Where they are cooked in different forms or used in different forms, be it... Um, a salad, be it fried, be it, um, you know, into other different dishes and so on. But um, as you saw from the, the article, there are a number of uses that we can put these, um, these products to. And we have the health benefits from those products. And we can now start looking at alternatives because, you know, the Caribbean region is now one of the lead regions in terms of um, high incidences of diabetes and hypertension, overweight, obesity. Even among our women, we have the, our women being 10% more obese than our men. So we have a serious challenge to address and using bananas can start the process of addressing some of these issues instead of holding on to the wheated flour, like, um, like the whole wheat, the white bread, the, you know, the rice. Um, all of these are very high in, in, in carbohydrates and, and offer, well, I would say predisposes our, our population because of the high levels of consumption. So having bananas um, integrated into our diets 
will really go a long way in helping to solve some of these ailments that we now face. Yeah, so you're saying that, that whole wheat is not necessarily more nutritious and more health-wise than, <laughs> well, than, than white flour? <laughs> well, I would, <laughs> I would ask persons now, everyone has access to a smartphone, they have access to computers. So I will ask um, persons to do some homework and do their own, um, their own research you know, to be educated on, on these different types of foods and the benefits that they bring to, to each of us. Yes. So, but, but overall, the position is that um, fig in all its manifest... Banana, banana, is health, banana is healthier because of the high percentage of fiber um, and water compared to the other dense carbohydrates like rice and, and flour yeah. and so on. You, if you're cooking... Um, looking for something to cook um, in terms of getting your carbohydrates um, requirements, um, bananas. One cannot eat bananas every day, but you can integrate it into your menu um, several times during the week in different forms, as I indicated before. Yeah. Ripe bananas is to, to us the premium fruit. Um, compared to a number of the other fruits. I think we'll get back to the point where, say, for instance, in reading the, uh, the, the history of development in Jamaica, for instance, um, uh, bananas were, you know, were, or a banana was um, a crop up there with, you know, before the days of aluminum and so on. You had this, the, the, the banana levy, yes. you know, the kind of things that um, the late um, Michael Mann used to talk about, how important that was. Do you think we, we, we will go back there or we should be going back there to increase the production across the region? Well, yes and no. For example, in countries like St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, St. Lucia, um, Grenada to some extent, these countries were really banana economies. Yes. They were not sugarcane. They were banana economies um, in the 19, um, 90s, 2000, and so on. Banana contributed to over 100 million in foreign exchange earnings in some of these countries. And so um, it really created an independence in the rural communities and so on for persons. Since we had the challenges of the European Union market regime and the competitiveness in terms of us being able to meet the competition from Dole and Chiquita, the challenges as they relate to meeting the European Union um, food standards and the global gap, which were some of the major challenges faced with the small farmers to meet these requirements in terms of certification. Um, a number of these countries have lost their comparative advantage of producing bananas. And so to go back into bananas will require a higher level of um, science and technology. Um, and a different strategy. So I can see farmers producing bananas, but perhaps not in the traditional way that it was done before. And that will not be recommended. We need now greater innovation and technology yeah. to be able to drive that process. And that is what we are demonstrating here in Tobago. Right. And so yes. Go ahead. Yes, bananas. Because as I said we have not really had a stable crop for small farmers to depend on as a source of income. Remember when you plant, say, vegetables, any vegetable, tomatoes, cabbage, as soon as that crop is harvested, you have to now go back again, replant, prepare the land, replant, and start the whole cycle all over again. In terms of bananas once you carry properly you can have a banana crop going for at least four to five years if you are managing it properly in terms of taking care of the followers and applying the necessary um, cultural practices upon so bananas can be what we consider as a cash the, the sort of um, cash cow for small farmers with integrated stems around it. So you, instead of depending on bananas alone, you have banana as an anchor and you have the other commodities around it. Why? Because every week you can harvest bananas 
or every other week you can harvest bananas and get a source of income. Yeah. Whereas the other commodities, once you finish harvesting, you have to wait again until such time that um, the crop matures and ready for harvesting. So that integrated approach is perhaps one of the best approach that we can, we can encourage farmers to, um, to become engaged in, yes. in order to ensure a steady flow of, of income. All right, so when, when uh, and, and where, when you come to Trinidad, where, where will the focus be? So it's, the focus is in Roxborough, in, in Tobago. When, when you well, Roxborough, to... Roxborough and, and Kendall area. Yes. And um, Trinidad, we have to discuss a little more with the Ministry of Agriculture and the technocrats there and to identify the few farmers who we can work with to be able to roll out this technology. But we want to make sure that we have it right in these areas in Tobago first before rolling it out to, um, to Trinidad. All right. Well, well, great stuff and much to, to look forward to there, Mr. Robertson. Yeah. Thank you very much for yes. talking with us on this. Thank you very much. All right. Ruben Robertson, the country representative yes. for the Food and Agriculture Organization in Trinidad and Tobago, heralding a revival or calling for it, a revival for on all these grounds and, and more about the sacred banana, the ripe figure, the green figure, as we call it. Well, thank you very much. Well, let's do this. Um, just before we wrap up, we want you to watch this. Um, uh, this is sharing a, a guy's attempt at holding a, a venomous Portuguese man or jellyfish. Take a look at this. So check this out. There's a venomous Portuguese man of war right next to the boat. I'm going to try to pick it up and not get stung. You guys, watch this. I'm going to try this out. I'm going to try to grip this thing with my hands. This thing is, this thing's extremely bad if it is to touch your fingers. I'm going to try to lift it out of the water. You can only top, touch the top part of it. Definitely. It's too heavy to lift. Can I just reach in and try to grab the whole thing? Look at the stingers on this thing, y'all. Look at this thing, y'all. If that touches you, it could have been a whale of pain. All right, well, let's just uh, tell you what's in, in these newspapers, the News of Tobago and the News of Trinidad and Tobago. The top story in the News of Tobago, uh, what we were talking about in the, in the segment that's prior to the one we just completed there, the fuel price, the fuel price, and what would impact will be on Tobago operations, the Tobago boat operators and fishermen and the chamber. They're saying that the fuel price will, the fuel price hike will make life harder in that country. That and other things on the front page of today's News Day Tobago, the story about Watson Duke eyeing Trinidad and Tobago. You know, of course, he launched his Trinidad branch of the PDP, and he's saying that they were going alone. Who wants to join them? Finally, they're not going into any coalition. Will we see as, as we go along there? It's either PDP or bust. That's what he's saying. And stakeholders warn of the gas price hike and the story of a uh, young Mr., the, the, the gentleman who um, went back on the, on the stage and got the other gold medal in the President's Awards. He's also featured there as well. That's the back page of today's Newsday Tobago. On the front page of the Newsday, Trinidad and Tobago, homeless and afraid of fire guts a woman, a uh, home of a woman hiding from her abuser. The discussions about abuse of one kind or another, what you call it domestic abuse, or domestic violence. Um, there's a debate about that. We continue to tell you about that. And so that the front page of the news day today, the back page, you see women warriors excited to play in Tobago. The Trinidad and Tobago skipper anticipates an historic match versus Guyana. So those things and more in your news day publications today on this day, Tuesday, April 12, 2022. And that's our broadcast for this morning. We want to thank you for watching. And as usual, we tell you, you can stay with us here on all our social media platforms. You can send your email to amprime at wesncc.com. But for now, I'm Andy Johnson telling you that at the top of the hour, we have news again, followed by today's edition of Talking Point with Sean Small. But thanks for watching this program. we see you tomorrow.